Jared was speaking from Romans chapter 12 and he got me reading Romans chapter 12 and uh, you know it is one of those passages so turn there if you will it's one of those passages that um, that is a uh, is a benchmark for our Christian faith and um, you know the Apostle Paul is there and it starts with that I beseech you by the mercies of God to present yourself as a living sacrifice and he talks about how that um, it is a reasonable thing to do or it's the only smart thing to do. Uh, it's, it's the only sensible thing to do in, in light of the world and in light of destiny and in, in light of our fallen nature and in light of all that comes against us. The only smart thing to do is to present yourself to God that he might... Uh, and it goes on to say, and this is where Jared was sort of, em his emphasis was upon the fact that, you know, we should not be, you know, conformed to this world, but we should be transformed by the renewing of the mind that we might prove that which is, which is the good, acceptable, the perfect will of God for our lives, you know. And, and it's wonderful to know that God has a perfect will for us and... Um, and that we can discover it by simply laying aside who we are and who we think we are and what we think is important and just laying it aside and laying ourselves down upon the altar of grace to discover what truly is important and what truly matters and to know that that is perfection. Because we all want that, don't we, in our lives. And, uh, but, you know, it goes on. That's where Jared was. But it goes on and it talks about how, you know, God has gifted us to... Uh, to be able to, to, to live this life. And then it goes on and talks about, about um, really the authentic Christian life. And when we talk about the authentic Christian life, what we're talking about is we're talking about walking in God's love. You know, as it says behind me, you know, the love of God. And, and, you, and we think about the love of God and, and you know, and the, hum the human world has no understanding of what love really is all about. They see it as an, an emotional attachment, an emotional commitment that is all about me, 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 isn't it? You know, I love you so much, I can't live without you, you know. There's a lot of eyes in that sentence, isn't there? It's all about me and what my need is, and that's how the world perceives love, and that's how the world communicates love. If you really loved me, then you would do this for me. You know? And of course, the love of God is completely diametrically opposed to that principle, isn't it? The love of God is all about me for you. you, know? you know? It's about giving of myself. And I discover that in giving of myself, I can find fulfillment. When I make myself about you, that's when life is realized. Because the greatest verse in the Bible, and I can't say that, but the most well-known verse in the Bible is a reflection of the very heart and the very will and the very purpose of God in that God so loved the world that he did something. He gave his only begotten Son. And whosoever should believe on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. His son didn't come to condemn the world, but by through him we might be saved, it says. It's all about God giving, and it's the very heart of God. And so what we notice, that love is something very foreign to this world, well, genuine love that's going to change this world and identify you as a believer. You know, it says on that thing behind me there, you know, love has an, it has an energy, it has a morality, it has a generosity, it has a commitment, you know. And that's what I want to look at this morning, if we will. Um, Romans chapter 5 says this, that the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That's Romans 5.5. 5. You, you don't need to go there if, unless you really want to, of course. You know. But it's been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit and so God has given us his love and God has you know, given us the spirit of God that we might have the strength of God to walk in this love. And, and the way you love is simply by being obedient to God's word and relying upon the spirit of God to lead us in this world, in God's love. Love, and I'm going to say that a lot, I guess, I guess this morning, in, in God's love, because, you know, and we need to understand that, that it's not something that we can of ourselves generate. It's not something that we of ourselves can even maintain, but it is something that is born of God in you. 
It is something that is sustained of God in you. It is something that is, 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 is spread from you because of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. But, you know, and, and, and it's very important that you and I understand that because we naturally are not that way. Because you know, we naturally are very selfish, aren't we? We naturally are very easily offended. Haven't you noticed that about us? We are naturally very judgmental of one another. Have you noticed that? You know, we're very selfish, we're easily offended, and we're very judgmental. But God wants us to love regardless of any circumstances that we might find ourselves in. God wants us to be deliberate in love, deciding to love. It's a decision of our will, you know. Even when we are rebuked, even when we are attacked... That's what the love of God is really all about. That's when it shines. Because it's so easy to love when everybody is placating to me. Isn't that right? When they're telling me how wonderful I am and they're telling me that you know, I, am the, I am the whatever. It's easy when I'm being loved to love. But it really shines when against our nature and against our bent that we choose, that we are decisive. To love. And quite frankly, our selfish, uh, how can I describe it? I've already done it, I know. But our selfish, oversensitive, judgmental little natures simply by themselves are not capable of doing that. They're not. And so that's why the born-again Christian The person with the Spirit of God dwelling within them, you know, can love with this. Well, the word is unconditional, isn't it? This unconditional love doesn't need anything in return. And so Paul begins with the fact, and I just want to start in the ninth verse. I didn't verse, I didn't tell you that, did I? Paul begins with the fact that the love that we love with is um, one of sincerity. Notice what it says there in that verse. Let love be without hypocrisy. Now, th- this is a verse, or this is a word that we Christians are very familiar with. Let, let us love without hypocrisy. In other words, let our love be sincere. Let it be without hypocrisy. Now, this is absolutely foundational to our conduct. What is the hypocrite? The hypocrite is someone that wears a mask. Isn't that right? The hypocrite is someone who's pretending to be something that they are not. And we live in a culture that is constantly encouraging us to live with an image, to be something that we aren't. You know, someone that wears a mask, someone that is pretending to be something that they're not. And uh, we must not I know this is simple, but we must not do this. There's deep and profound teaching for you, isn't it? You know, as a Christian, we must not do this. I mean, who, we, we know how grating it is, isn't it? When we are involved in a relationship that is full of all these phony civilities. Don't you know how grating that is? You do, don't you? You know, when someone says, yeah, yes, I really hope it works out for you. I am so blessed that you are prospering, that you're doing so well in your life, you know. And these phony, I mean, they're good when they're genuine, but you you know what it's like when you're in these phony, with these phony civilities, when people are saying these sorts of things, and you know too well that they would throw a party if trouble came your way. You know, that they would rejoice in the fact that you are tumbling down from your high tower. You know, that's the tragic thing about hypocrisy. But we must love without hypocrisy. It's not an option. It's not an option in your Christian life. Let me read to you what 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8 says. It says, Above all things, you have a fervent love one for another. We read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, The end of the commandment is to love out of, here it is, to love out of a pure heart, and a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And then, of course, we have in John's Gospel, 
All men, as Jesus said, will know that you are my disciples because of the love you have one towards each other. This is a call for us to honestly examine our hearts, asking the question, and I want to ask you to ask yourself the question this morning, are you loving and do you love? Do you make a decisive choice to love without hypocrisy? And if I am speaking words, you know, if I am speaking words of love and acceptance, and yet in my heart there is hatefulness, there is resentment, that's not the word, resentfulness, resentfulness towards a brother or sister in Christ, then I'm a hypocrite. I'm living a hypocritical life. And what I have to do is I've got to get, you know, if I've got this smiling face with this stuff going on in the inside, then I've got to get on my knees before God and I've got to pray and I've got to ask Him to show me the reality of the face that I show to men compared to the reality of the heart that's living within me and ask Him to change me. I've got to do that because no one will recognize Christ in me. No one can see Christ in me that way. Now, the sincere, unhypocritical love of God again, is the foundation for all that we do. And I think that's why the Apostle Paul starts there in this little passage, is the foundation of everything that we do. If you are not real, then you are seen coming a mile away. Isn't that right? We can deceive ourselves in our little Christian bubble with our God bless yous and praise God and thank you, Lord, and you and you know, and I love you, brother, I love you, sister. We can carry on like that amongst ourselves in the bubble, but I tell you, it doesn't work out there, does it? But God wants us to know, he wants the world to know that the love amongst us, shared amongst us, is genuine. In fact, it's, again, it's the identifying mark. We should not be acting, is all I want to say this morning. It's challenging, isn't it? Because we act, don't we? We're all on a stage, we're all performing, we're all trying to impress people, we're all trying to do that. Um, where do I go from here? Let's just keep reading, shall we? Let's have a look at some, the specifics of this love, if you will. It says in that ninth verse again, abhor, it says love without, without hypocrisy, but abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Abhor what is evil. In other words, detest, hate. That's what that means. What is evil. And cling to what is good. And when it says cling to, it, the idea of the word cling there is, is to be glued to. It means to attach yourself to it. To things that are good. Not be separated from things that are good. Hate evil, cling to what, join yourself to what is good. And some might think that love is soft on evil. Have you noticed that? S some think that, you know, and, you know, and we need this, mor but we need this moral resolve as a believer that, um, that evil, and there is nothing about it that can be good or desired. It, God hates it. Likewise, we should likewise hate it. But the world is out there desensitizing us to the reality of good and evil, isn't it? To the point now where people are loving, as the Bible said we would, are loving that which is evil and hating that which is good. And that's where the world is at, you know. I had a conversation with someone just yesterday, you know, espousing the virtues of a particular political party because they want to look after our environment. And I said, but hang on a minute. They want to look after our environment, but they will happily kill our unborn children. You know, work it out, you know. But this poor soul couldn't see it because all this poor soul was worried about our future depends upon our environment. I said, no, 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 that's not the issue. You know, we're in a moral decline. Morally, we are going to be destroyed if we don't do something about it. Isn't that right? It's a slippery slide that we're entering into. 
And the results of last night's election terrify me, quite frankly. The direction of the heart of man, the way people are are, are going, is a tragic thing. No, hating evil and and loving good. We we say we hate we we say we hate evil, but we love the person that practices evil, don't we? And that's true, isn't it? Easier said than done, but it's but it's very true. And the whole context of this passage that we are looking in is all about our relationship with people. That's what Paul is talking about. And so, child of God, hate that which is evil in people, but don't reject the person because of the evil. That's the statement. I know we quote that line all the time, don't we? But a hypocritical love does that, doesn't it? Hypocritical love does that. It rejects the person because of the way they behave and they no longer become acceptable to us because they are not meeting our standards of goodness, if you will. You know, and so, so rather than loving the person and hating the, the evil, we reject the person because of the evil. And, and that's insidious within our society. But it's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy to reject someone because of what they are doing. Because, you know, again, where's our picture? Where's our standard? It's the heart of God. God so loved the world. In the world, it says, he didn't just love those that were looking forward to his coming. He just didn't love those that were rejoicing in who God's goodness is. No, he died for the world that was hating him and rejecting him. And the Bible says, we were, while we were yet sinners. What does that mean? That means we were hating God. We were hating righteousness. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We must never lose sight of the standard that has been set before us. So to reject people with prejudice, to reject people with contempt or disdain is hypocritical as a Christian. You can't do it. And you know that. You know that. Hey, but here's something else. It's also equally hypocritical to condemn sin. Oh no, to condone sin because you accept the person. Now we do that, don't we? We condone sin in a person's life because we want to accept the person. Love never condones sin it never does it is relentless in its hatred of sin why because of the incredible damage that it does and the price that was paid for it again we look at jesus it hates sin it loathes it and and but love finds what love does this is what love does love finds the balance by doing what what does it cling to what does it attach itself to to good doesn't it it clings to good And love will find the good and it will hold on firmly and it will never let go. You see, you can hate everything about the person, everything that they do. You can look at a person's life and you can say there is absolutely nothing redeemable in the things that they do. But if you forgive, what is forgiveness? It's good, isn't it? It's good to forgive. Let me say it again. You can absolutely hate everything about a person's life. You can find nothing redeemable in anything that they do. But if you cling to the good, God tells you to forgive. If you will forgive and you will hang on to that and never let it go, you sit back and watch God will do in that relationship. It's incredible what God will do when we just cling with all that God has given us to good and not loving the evil. Now, are you with me? Have I, have I, am I clear? hope so. Sounded mixed up from the back of my head, that's all. So I don't know what it's like when it's coming out here. Now, so next we, we see love's commitment is what we see. And specifically, of course, it's talking about our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, look at what verse 10 says. It says, excuse me a sec. It says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. Translation, 
be devoted with warm family love to one another with a brotherly love. Be devoted to one another with a warm family love. Devoted like a brother or like a sister. See, this speaks of our family type devotion to one another. You know, it's far from, far from just a friendship, isn't it? You know, it's, 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 not just that we, it's not just that we know one another or we understand one another. It's not that at all. No, we are related to one another. This is the emphasis of this, of this verse. We are related to one another. We cannot quit one another. Do you realize that? We say it all the time. You, know, well, you cannot quit. You cannot quit me. You cannot give up on me. You cannot abandon me. I cannot quit you. I cannot give up on you. I cannot abandon you. Why? Because we are related. We're family. It's like this. My natural brothers and sisters could never be in a place where I will reject them. They can't do it. It's the same as my children. My children can never do anything that's going to put me in a place where I look at them and say, you are dead to me. It's never going to happen. The love of God in me will not allow it to take place. It can't be. It's an impossibility. Can I say it again? You know, that, that's what this family is all about. And that's what we are as brothers and sisters. We are this family who cannot quit one another. Now, love also takes pleasure in the elevation of other family members, doesn't it? This is where it gets really... I've already said this, I know. But, but look at that verse 10 again, where it finishes, in honour giving preference to one another. You see, this is the way that church ought to be, isn't it? Honouring one another, giving preference to one another. You see, my love for you will never allow me to be separated from you because I put myself before you. This is the ideal, okay? This is how it's meant to be. My love for you should always seek. Remember the posture of a Christian? Do you remember what it is? Do I have to show you again? Is this it? Is this our posture? Is this what it is down on top of you, Phil? Or is this my posture? Is this the posture of a Christian? It's here, isn't it? It's underneath. It's lifting. It's supporting. That's the posture of a Christian. And love will always do that. It will come underneath and it will lift up others. It will make preference of the others. The heart of God cannot do anything else within a believer. This is genuine godly love. It's the way it needs to be for us to be able to operate as God wants us to be, for the world to look at us and say genuinely there is a love in them that they can't explain. It's the love of God. Because you know what? What self does, this over top, self destroys family. It does. It destroys family. You know the song that I quote so often. You know, you know with a little boy, do you remember the film clip? What about me? The song? Remember it? The little boy, who was from the 70s? I asked this not long ago. Who was from the 70s remembers the film clip? Of, yeah, of the little boy, yeah, of the little boy coming into the, the lolly shop or whatever it was, and everybody was in front of him, and they were all pushing past him, and he just wanted to get served, and he couldn't get there, you know, and this little boy sitting there pushed back, pushed back until finally, finally something within him wells up, and he just cries out of the top of his voice, What about me? It isn't fair. I want my share. What about me? And we look at that and we with tear in our eyes, maybe not. But we look at that and we go, oh, isn't that so sad? It's, you know, you've got to listen to the kid. Oh, yeah, sure. But stop for a minute and think about that principle of life. If every single one of us was going, what about me? What would the world be like? If every single one of us was only concerned about me getting my share, what would the world be like? What a horrible place. That will be hell on earth. You know that? But the opposite is true as well. What if every single one of us was concerned about the other person? If your needs were more important to me than mine, imagine if we were all like that. That's when... 
That's heaven on earth, isn't it? That, that's glorious when we are living that way. And so we've got to understand that the love of God exalts others. It humbles itself. And it comes to that posture of supporting. Philippians chapter 2, one of my favorite verses, where it says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let us esteem others better than ourselves. That's the posture of the Christian life. Paul says this is how it needs to be. Now, he goes on and, and, he's going to cha- and he challenges us now with, as it says on the sign there, really with, with, the, with the, the energy of what love is. is. Uh, let, let me tell you what I mean. Look at verse 11. He says, It's not lagging in diligence, fervent in s- spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. See, that's what I call the energy of love. Let me read it again. It's not lagging in diligence. It's fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Enthusiasm, you might say, is a notable mark of Christian love, of the Christian walk, when we're walking in the spirit of God. It's a notable mark, you know, that word fervent there in that verse. It means to, the idea, it's, it, it's one of those words that sounds what it means. Fervent, it means to burn, it means, it means to glow, you know. So, so it never lags in diligence or zeal, as it says. It rejoices in your hope, rejoicing always in hope, patient in tribulation. In other words, it holds up under pressure. That's what patience means. It holds up under pressure. And of course, as we read, it is constant in prayer. In other words, what love does, it always practices the presence of God. God is always there, as someone was saying to me before the church service. Allow the love of God to be an energy, when you look at that description, to be an energy that burns within you towards those around you. It's the love of God that drives me. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul would say? The love of God that constrains me. You know, and that man, he just never stopped, did he? I mean, humanly, there is no way the Apostle Paul could have done the things that he did as he loved God's people, as he's concerned for the brethren. But he said, it's the love of God that constrains, it drives me, you know. And while you may grow weary in loving people, you will never grow weary of loving people. Because there's something in you, it's the Spirit of God that will not hate, but will cling to God, to that which is good. That's what's going on inside of you, child of God. So, Burns, think about that word. Glows. What's the opposite of that? Burns, glows. The opposite is dull, isn't it? The opposite of that. I say that because I'm going to digress a little bit because there's only one thing. Well, there's a few things, but there's one thing that really nauseates God. You know what it is? You go to the book of Revelation, you can read it in the third chapter, in the 14th, no, 16th verse, I think it is. Who knows? What is that one thing that nauseates God? A lukewarmness, isn't it? See, isn't that, isn't, that a, isn't that an opposite to what Paul is describing when he says about the love of God? It burns, it glows, but lukewarmness, it, it, it just nauseates God. Neither hot nor cold, just going along with the crowd. God says, it makes me sick. It makes him sick. So again, be fervent in your love as you serve the Lord. I mean, just think of David. I mean, I love David. We all love David. This young shepherd boy. Think of David. And then think of this giant nine-foot man, Goliath. You know the story. You know, he brought this Goliath, brought all of Israel, the entire army of Israel, to, to this state of fear and, 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 and despair. 
And no one had the strength, no one had the, the, no one had the, the enthusiasm to be able to rise up against this man. No one but, of course, we know the story, young David. You know, it's great, isn't it? And without fear and without doubt, he looked at this impressive giant of a man and with the fervency of the Lord in his heart, and the purpose of God, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who dares to defy the armies of the living God? What a, don't you want to be there? Didn't you want to hear that come from his lips? You know, incredible, isn't it? You know, that, and you think of recent history, you think of men of God that, that you know, that, that, with imp- that just simply will not stop, you know. Because the, the love of God constrains them. We look at men like John Wesley, you know, who, who on an average, you know, he rode 120 kilometers a day, not in a comfortable car, but on the back of a horse. And he preached three messages a day. The love of God constrained him. We hear testimonies of men like Moody, who had said, he often said at the end of the day, his final prayer was simply this, Lord, I'm tired, you know. You know, it's incredible, isn't it? Luther was another one who literally just fell into bed. But again, they were never weary of the, the Lord serving the Lord and loving God's people. Never weary of it. Yes, they got weary in it because they're human beings. They got tired. But again, the love of God constrains them. Why? Because they hate evil. They see the damage that evil does. They cling to that which is good because they see the redeeming value of someone being good and hanging on to good. You know, they're devoted to the family of God. They will never abandon the family of God. And they labor with this enthusiasm. And it's always available. Why? Because the Spirit of God is the thing that's driving them. And are they any different to you and I? They're not exactly the same. Just fallen human beings who had the Spirit of God in them, driven by the love of God for one another. You know, we hold these people up as spiritual giants, and yes, they were, but they're no different to you and I. Where the same love that was poured into them, Romans 5, is the love that is poured into you and I. Never lose sight of that. Never lose sight of that truth. Um, it's a true love. True love. What do I sound like? <laughs> it's a movie, I know. No, no, no. True love. He's almost dead. No. Oh, I've got to stop this, don't I? Princess Bride, sorry. Let's move on. Sorry, I'm, I digress. Okay. So, all right, let me just finish this off. Lastly, um, we see love... We see love cares, we know that. And we see that love is generous. We see that love practices hospitality is what we see. And that's a Christian word, isn't it? You know, it's one word that we we've really it's our word, hospitality, you know. Look at verse thirteen. Distributing it says to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. Here's the thing. The difference between living in Australia and the third world, a third world country, is that we tend to forget that people have real needs in our community, don't we? Why? Because we're not confronted by it every single day. See, if you lived in a third world country, the moment you open your eyes and you stepped out into the street, as you stepped over the fellow begging outside your door, you know, or the people going through the rubbish, or the people begging on the streets. You know, every single day they're confronted, you're confronted by it. But here in, the, here in our world, yeah, this is our problem for us, you see. We're not confronted by it, and you and I know that we can go through an entire day being conscious of nothing but my own needs. Isn't that right? I do it all the time. You know, I've got this clock going in my head. This is my day. This clock that's going in my head says, okay, you've got to be here then, and then you've got to be there, and then you've got to be there, and then you've got to be there, and you've got to get home, and then you've got to put on another hat, and then you've got to become this person, and you've got to go and do that. And, you know, most days of the week, we don't, you, know, you don't get home much before 10 o'clock. You know, Donna hates me for it. No, she does. She loves me for it. Sorry. 
She hates the fact that I'm not there a lot. But, you know, and this is my life and I'm going like this and I'm, you know, and I'm thinking, me, you know. And I can get my entire day just conscious of the fact that I'm here and completely, completely oblivious to the fact that there are people all around me that have incredible needs. You know, Christians, we have a direct responsibility to care for one another, to provide for one another. You know, we care for one another, we provide for one another, we give for one another. We should be willing to give out of our substance to help one another. That's where it starts to get a bit offensive, isn't it? When the preacher starts saying things like that. But it's true. We should be willing to dig into our pockets to be able to support one another. It's just how it's meant to be, people, within this body of Christ. Christ's church is living family, loving one another, supporting one another, providing for one another. It doesn't mean that any of us just can sit back and expect to receive. No, not at all. No, but hospitality, hospitality says, I'm just aware of you and you're aware of me. You see, we think that when it says given to hospitality, we think that means I should invite one of my friends home after church and give them, have dinner with them after church, you know. Because that's not what hospitality is. Well, it is, but it's not what the Bible talks about. Hospitality is so much broader than that. When Paul talks about hospitality, he's using a word that is interfering in my plans. Do you realize that? Because I plan for hospitality. You know, okay, we'll have somebody over on a particular day and we will have a meal together. You know? That's planning hospitality. That's not what this word really means. This word means having a heart of love that sees. In fact, you know what this word means? This word means to go looking for them. In your community, go looking for those that have a need. Have an eye open to see with a fervent love for those that have a need. Can you imagine what it would be like if we live like this? Can you really imagine what church community would be like if we really practiced this love? It'd be dynamic, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? So why don't we? Why don't we? You know, the world will be changed. That's what the promise of the Bible is. This love that will change the world. Imagine how much we would grow in Christ. Imagine how much the saints would be encouraged. Imagine the testimony of God's love moving through this world. It would never be the same. That's why 12, 12 people turn the world upside down for Christ. And now there's millions of us, millions of us thinking about me, singing the song. I, me, and mine. It's a tragedy, isn't it? I know there's no one in this room. But let us be aware, hey? So that's all I want to say this morning. What an incredible quality of life we can have if we would just love one another with sincerity. If we would hate sin and we would cling to that which is good. If we would have a commitment to family members, if we would recognize the importance of family and one another, and if we would live in this supernatural, and that's what it is, this supernatural energy, this zeal of God's love, joyful, joyful, Lifting one another up, faithful in prayer. Imagine it. All the petty little squabbles we have, you know. He said this, he did that, she didn't treat me right. Poof. Baby stuff. Baby stuff. Let's love with a love that will change the world, okay. Starts here in this room. Starts in our homes. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know it's so 
much deeper. We know it is so much richer than anything that I have said this day. But Lord, in this place, these hearts gathered before you, pray, Father God, that we would seek, Lord, not only to know this love, but to experience it in our lives, Father. And if we're in this place today, and we are separated from our brothers and sisters because of petty issues, O oh God. I ask you, Father, forgive us. I ask you, Father, that you would uh, cause us to go to one another, if we can today, this very morning, to restore ourselves one to another, to let your love bring about a healing prosperous touch upon our lives thank you for the testimony that can come from this body of believers thank you father that we know this world can be changed because of just the few hearts that are gathered in this room today let it not just be words father let it not just be a knowledge of god but father help us as the apostle paul to recognize and to be driven by the most precious, most powerful thing in this creation, your precious love, Lord. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Amen.